Welcome to Fortune Forecast. I am Daisy, your hostess, and you are joining me as we've started on the book titled The Psychic Life of Jesus. This book was written by Reverend G. Maurice Elliott and published by the Spiritualist Press in 1938. If you are new to the channel, thank you so much. Glad you found us. And if you would like to catch up with the previous chapters, please visit my book playlist and grab those chapters. And if you just want to get to the reading, please get to the description and hit that timestamp. Otherwise, stay here a minute with me as I share my narrator's comments regarding the past chapters. I took a few notes down. And when the author was talking about one of the incidents where Jesus had performed all those miracles and he worked really, really long and hard and helped everyone, and that after that he sought solitude. And in that solitude, he also mentioned when one is giving out so much, then one must take in. And probably this has happened with you when you overwork and you just spent and, and you need to have that time alone to replenish yourself. Of course, Jesus went there to fill himself with divine energy and to rebuild his chi. And I liked how uh, it was stated that Peter found him in prayer. He wasn't praying, big difference, but he found him in prayer. And it's interesting because I believe that sometimes you could be sitting still and you could be in prayer. And there's a sense and aura about that that feels sacred. Maybe even as you look at a leaf or you look up at the sky, it is in a certain state that you don't have to say certain words to fill yourself and receive that ever healing energy. So I seem to understand that at that level for me. Uh, The other thing that I wrote down here for myself as notes was how, again, um, we're talking about faith. And how faith is one of the biggest things that is needed in manifesting, whether you're manifesting a healing or many other things, as Jesus quoted saying, as is thy faith, so be it unto you. So now let's put this on on just that bigger picture here and, and have an inclusive feeling of whether the person believes in a religion or in Jesus or, or not. Let's move that just how it seems to be in one's life when you want something so bad and you feel in your inner gut that it's going to come true for you and nothing, nothing can get in the way because your faith is so strong in yourself or in what it is that you're going to be pursuing that nothing else can get in the way. And so that is where... I understand this to to come from, from that area of that faith. Of course, how deeply do you believe in something? That's how it will be done unto you. And so I get that as well. Then the other one uh, talked about, you know, the, the healing. And was it a healing when Jesus healed the leper? And the author, Reverend Elliot, was saying, Well, no, it wasn't a miracle. It was faith. How many times have you heard of someone go to the doctor and the doctor said, well, take this medication and in three days you're going to feel well. And for some unknown reason, that could have been a placebo. And in three days, the person was feeling well. So again, the person put faith in what the doctor was saying. And then therefore they became healed because they had that faith. So it's nothing much has changed with that. I get that as well. And then another area which I will need to do some research and bring this to the channel, which were the laws. And this author mentioned four laws, physical laws, mental laws, spiritual laws, and psychical laws. And he, he brought this into that context of healing. And he was saying, well, God heals and God acts through his own laws. So the, the part here where he, the author was saying Jesus was bringing us this information, not only revealing God to man, but man to man, and un- bringing this understanding that as you conform with God's laws, you can move through and do many great things. So it's in understanding these laws. 
So I'd like to bring some more information about that at some future video. And I'd like to hear your comments. What do you think so far about some of this information that this author is sharing in this book? Okay, I'll go ahead and let's move over to the next chapter and see what else we can discover together. Chapter 8 Jesus healed a man who was blind and dumb and possessed with the devil. Was this healing miraculous? If it was, then miracles are being performed today. The term devil, as used in the Gospels, had not necessarily anything in common with the devil of popular imagination. The term Satan, as used in the Gospel, is not the Satan of Milton or of the Faust legend, nor the Satan of medieval pictures and mystery plays. Satan is not a rival god of evil, nor the absolute source of evil but the chief among many discarnate evil personalities. When Jesus healed this blind and dumb man, the multitudes were amazed and began to wonder whether he was the expected Messiah. But as they knew he was only a carpenter, they said, Surely this cannot be the Messiah. The Pharisees were furious with the people for having made so preposterous a suggestion and assured them that he was not the Messiah, but was a disguised and subtle messenger of Satan. Jesus tried to get them to be at least reasonable and pointed out the absurdity of their accusation by asking them, would Satan, the head of the organized kingdom of evil spirits, whose object is to bring men and the world under his dominion, cast out his own servants? Surely if he did so, he would be fighting against himself and destroying his own dominion. Jesus then turned against the Pharisees their own argument and said, If, as you say, I cast out devils by the prince of the devils, by whom do your exorcists cast them out? The Pharisees believed in and practiced exorcism. Their professional exorcists used smoke and water, magic herbs, and all sorts of incantations. Sometimes they exorcised by the power supposed to be wielded by the recitation of certain potent names, such as the names of the patriarchs. In Luke and Acts, we read of Jewish exorcists actually using the name of Jesus. But the Pharisees hated Jesus, whom they regarded as an unauthorized and unorthodox healer who was a blasphemer and a Sabbath breaker. Nothing he could say, no argument he advanced, seems to have had the least effect upon them. Their hatred deafened their ears to his message and blinded them to truth. Jesus therefore warned them that they were in danger of committing the sin against the Holy Ghost, which by its nature hath never forgiveness. What he meant was this, to attribute such a good work as that of healing a blind and dumb man to evil agency revealed a mind so set against the light and so lost to a sense of right and wrong as to lack the first condition of forgiveness. The Pharisees had seen an unmistakable instance of the working of a good and holy power in this healing deed of Jesus, but they had so blinded themselves to the light that they ascribed it to the power of the devil. In so doing, they were becoming involved in a sin that persists in a fixed disposition or character. Now, here is a curious thing. Bishop Gore, with the New Testament in hand, wrote his book, The Religion of the Church. In that book, he makes the following comment on spiritualism. I cannot help feel that if the experiences which spiritualists report are true experiences, it is more likely that they are the victims of clever demons than in real communication with the spirits of just men made perfect. Among the experiences which spiritualists report are cases of healing analogous to those reported in the Gospels. These healings the spiritualists attribute to the love and power of God mediated through his ministering spirits to his suffering children. Bishop Gore attributes them to the hate and power of clever demons. 
The implication is obvious. Fortunately for us all, his book bears the title, The Religion of the Church. Had it borne the title, The Religion of Jesus, it would have been blasphemous. And now we have the Bishop of Winchester, Dr. C. Garbett, condemning faith cures as very near the danger of magic. Can we wonder at Reverend John Maylard's strongly worded reply to the bishop to speak of magic among the sick and suffering is blasphemous? It means, of course, that there are bishops today who are committing the very sin against which Jesus warned the Pharisees. On the other hand, I have in front of me as I write an extract from an article written by a bishop who not only allowed a healing service to be held in his cathedral, but also took part in it, and who says, The last person whom we laid hands on Wednesday morning was blind in the left eye, and as she passed through the vestry the sight returned in full. Two dumb people spoke well. Two who were almost blind were quietly reading the newspapers on the following day. A child that had not walked for eight years walked steadily along the cathedral path to its mother and father. A woman of some thirty years who, on the evidence of the rector and relatives, had never spoken in her life, received the full gift of language. It is incredible, perhaps, but it is true. Instances could be multiplied manifold. Jesus, by the power of the Spirit working through him, was able to heal the blind and the dumb. At the healing service in Bathurst Cathedral, the bishop, by the power of the Spirit working through him, was able to heal the blind and the dumb. If I were to ask Mr. W. T. Parrish, one of the greatest healers within the spiritualist movement, to give me a list of the ailments which he, through the power of the same Spirit, has cured, the length of the list and the variety of the ailments would astonish the world. He would, I am sure, place first on that list the name of his wife who, some years ago, was dying of cancer and had been given only a few months to live, and whom he healed. After writing the above paragraph, I had a chat with Mr. Parrish over the phone, and I said to him, Parrish, I am writing about the healing ministry of Jesus, and I am right, am I not, in thinking that you have healed through the power of God's Spirit the blind, the deaf, the dumb? What happened in Galilee is happening in your healing sanctuary, is it not? Parrish replied, Oh yes, I am only a humble servant of God but he has permitted me to be the instrument through which cancer, tuberculosis, diabetes, and other diseases have been healed. But what is more important still, I have been told by those on the other side that there is great rejoicing in the spirit world that so many souls, as well as bodies, are being healed through the healing work in the sanctuary. Many are finding their way back to God through this ministry of healing. Now I really must ask my readers to compare the beautiful simplicity and sincerity and deep religious fervor of Parrish's statement with the Bishop Gore's dictum that if the experiences of spiritualists are true, it is more likely that they are the victims of clever demons. I am sorry to have to trouble you to make the comparison, but while it matters not to spiritualists what the Bishop has said, it matters greatly to the members of the Church of England. If I were to ask any of the great healers within the spiritualist movement the same question as I asked Parrish, they would supply me with astonishing information. Now, all these healers would attribute to the Spirit of God the healing powers they possess, and ascribe to God the power and the glory. And for anyone to suggest that their work has anything to do with clever demons or magic is, what word can one use? Jesus understood what this kind of opposition meant, for had he not experienced it from his nearest and dearest? We are told in the gospel story that, after he had performed signs and wonders, a woman in the crowd suddenly cried out, 
What a fortunate woman was your mother to have such a son. No, said Jesus, blessed is the person who hears the word of God and keeps it. For not only did the members of his family not help him in his work, they opposed him, opposed him openly. He had actually to separate himself from his relatives to do his work. When they heard that the Pharisees with the Herodians had taken counsel against him to see how they might destroy him, his relatives at least expected him to be silent. But when they found him determined to continue his work, and that he had actually chosen twelve men to assist him, they thought, like the Pharisees, that he was out of his mind. To be hated by the religious teachers of the people was bad enough, but it was far worse to be considered mad by mother and brothers. And so we read that when his mother and brothers found him in the midst of such a crowd that they could not get near him and sent a message to him, he replied, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Then, looking round on his few faithful followers, he said, These are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, the same is my brother, my sister, my mother. End of chapter. We'll stay right here and move on to chapter 9. Jesus could not have undertaken his missionary journeys or carried on his teachings, healing, and general psychic work without the necessary financial assistance. So far as we know, he had no private means. His brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, would doubtless have supported the mother and the home, but they would not have helped him. They did not believe in him. They sneered at him. They thought he was mad, and on one occasion wished to arrest him and convey him away from Capernaum. How then was Jesus supported? He was supported by gifts of love, by the thank offerings of those whom he had healed. The New Testament says so. We will return to this important point later. Meanwhile, let us ask an even more important question. What was it that convinced James and Judas that their psychically gifted brother, whom they thought mad, was nevertheless God's anointed messenger? It was the fact that he came back from the dead, that he materialized in the presence of over 500 persons and had appeared also to James, one of the four brothers. It was not his teaching that convinced them. It was not the beauty of his character that convinced them. It was the psychic manifestation of himself after death that changed these bigoted, materialistic, orthodox traditionalists into convinced and ardent spiritualists. During his ministry in the flesh, the brothers of Jesus knew that he possessed wonder-working powers, but they were not impressed. What did impress them was the fact that he had dared to break the Sabbath rules and to oppose the pillars of orthodoxy, for in so doing he had disgraced the family. They attributed his psychic powers to derangement of mind, if not to demon possession. If they believed in survival at all, it was probably only a nebulous belief in the shades of shell. But when they saw their brother alive from the dead, their whole outlook and attitude was changed. Is it not surprising that anti-spiritualist teachers today have the courage, or is it ignorance, to shout from their pulpits and platform, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead? They evidently forget, if they ever knew, the plain fact that two of Jesus' brothers were persuaded wholly and solely by his coming back to them from the dead. Had he not done so, we should never have had those two epistles in the New Testament written by his brothers James and Judas. The vast majority of men today need to have survival proved to them. The fact that, in a collection of ancient writings called the New Testament, it is reported that Jesus rose from the dead does not constitute proof to unbelievers that they also will survive death. At the moment, it is suggested that Jesus was unique, different in kind from other men. His resurrection can afford no possible proof that the average men, different in kind from him, 
will survive death. Let us now return to the question, how was Jesus supported? Dr. Luke tells us that certain well-to-do ladies supplied Jesus with money to carry on his work. He had healed them, and he felt it in no way beneath his dignity to be supported by those to whom he had given a new lease of life. He had given them goods so rich that they were ready to give him their earthly goods. They ministered unto him out of their property. It is interesting to notice who these ladies were. There was Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus had cast seven evil spirits. There is no reason whatever to believe that she was a fallen character. The popular idea of the Magdalene is a baseless libel. She was not the unnamed sinful woman who anointed Jesus, and possession does not necessarily presuppose moral failing in the victim's character. She had been healed by Jesus, not saved in the orthodox sense by him, though we may be sure that her soul received great upliftment, and she showed her gratitude by ministering to him out of her means. Then there was Joanna, the wife of Chusa, who was the manager of King Herod's estates. She was a lady of high position, and seems to have told Herod's foster brother that Jesus had healed her, for later we find this foster brother among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch. And then there was Susanna and many others who ministered to him out of their means in gratitude for having been healed by him. His psychic work, coupled with his teaching, made Jesus so busy that he had difficulty in finding time for meals. People from the town and country flocked to hear and to touch him. And one evening, after a particularly busy day, when great multitudes were about him, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side of the lake, just as we are. So they launched forth on their seven miles journey. The lake was far below the sea level and shut in with mountains. Sudden and fierce tempests often arose. Jesus was tired out with the day's work and sank down in the stern of the boat and with his head on a cushion fell fast asleep. The sky darkened, and the wind lashed the waves into fury. Matthew says it was like an earthquake in the sea. The boat was literally covered with waves and began to sink. His disciples, terror-stricken, cried out to Jesus, Master, Master, save us, we are going down. Jesus rose up calm and self-possessed and gave them a lesson in tranquil courage. What are you afraid of? He asked. Where is your faith? It was as if he had said to them, You have seen me exercise my psychic powers ever since you have been with me, and have been amazed. You knew that I had rebuked a fever which had immediately left its victim, and that I had told you that all things are possible to him that believeth. Why then do you not trust me now? Jesus then rebuked the storm, and addressing it as if it were some raging beast, said, Be muzzled and be silent. The wave subsided, the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Did it ever happen? Did Jesus actually calm a storm at sea? Was it a miracle? The Orthodox traditionalist says, of course it was. What else could it have been? The unorthodox modernist says, it is common knowledge that these lake storms die down as suddenly as they arise, and all that Jesus did was tell his disciples to have a little courage and faith and the storm would soon cease. His words were, of course, exaggerated when written down many years after the event. The spiritualist, being aware of the almost incredible findings of psychic science, says, It was certainly not a miracle. On the other hand, the report of it is not necessarily an exaggeration. All great psychics have had extraordinary powers. They have shown that what may be termed spiritual law can and does supersede what is termed natural law. I say what is termed because no one can say that spiritual law is less natural than natural law. We know so little. Jesus was a highly developed human being who assured men that if they had faith, they would be able to do the works that he did, and greater. 
his disciples and earthly followers had begun to do the works that he did. But about the third century, this advance was arrested by the church's suppression of exercise of psychic gifts. Faith no longer meant trust in God, in the God-given powers within, and in the development and exercise of those powers. Faith was made to mean trust in a church, trust in creeds and systems and priests and popes. And men became highly developed church beings, not human beings. Their God-given powers were deemed to be devil-given powers. And if any man dared to exercise these gifts, he was either tortured or put to death, sometimes both. My point is that we cannot say what powers man possesses, what he is capable of achieving and doing, unless he is given every opportunity to develop them. If, since the days of Jesus, there had been no suppression of men's psychic faculties, heaven only knows what the followers of Jesus might have accomplished. There are men in the East today whose psychic powers are so great as to be almost incredible to us Westerners. And during the past hundred years, there has been a remarkable advance in the West, owing largely to the fact that the Church no longer deems it wise to torture and burn the psychically gifted. It is common knowledge that in the presence of certain psychics, what is called natural law is constantly superseded by physical law. Spiritualists know far too much to allow themselves to be hurried into denying or explaining away the nature miracles of the Bible. If Jesus calmed the storm at sea, there's no reason why other men should not do the same when their psychic faculties are fully developed. And if Jesus did not calm the storm, there's no reason why highly developed men of the future should not do so. End of chapter. Stay right here with me on this video. Grab your coffee, grab your tea, whatever time of day, grab your wine as I move on to chapter 10. Jesus calmed a storm at sea. Was that storm unexpected? Or did Jesus know it would come? The question may sound irrelevant, but those who have read the riddle of the New Testament will know that the question is part of the riddle. It would seem that, on occasions, Jesus purposely set the stage for a demonstration of his psychic power, and on this occasion he probably had prevision of the storm which would so well suit his purpose and deliberately set out with his disciples to meet it. What was that purpose? He wanted to show his disciples that a fully developed man had power to control storms in the natural world and storms in the physical world. And so we find no sooner has he calmed a storm in the natural world than another storm. A storm in the psychical world needs his healing power. In the twilight of the morning after the storm, Jesus and his disciples reached the coasts of the half-heathen Gadarenes. In those days, mad men were in no way understood. They were treated more like animals than human beings and were driven out of the towns. They had to live in the tombs, in the caves, in the rocks, and there they grew worse and worse. Jesus and his disciples landed near an old cemetery and were met by the awful cries of a man possessed with an unclean spirit. On looking up, they saw, some distance away, a murderous-looking lunatic of immense strength. The authorities had bound the poor fellow with fetters and chains, but he had broken them to pieces. The storm at sea had excited him to frenzy, and when he caught sight of Jesus, he came bounding towards him in all his fierceness. But as he drew near him, his violence subsided, and he fell prostrate in awe at his feet. It was probably quite natural, quite scientific, that he should have done so. How little we know of the mysterious power of the spiritual and the psychical. But we do know that all's love and all's law. 
the psycho-spiritual power which streamed forth from Jesus would probably have caused the madman to become temporarily sane and driven him to Jesus for protection. Jesus did not regard the man as the victim of a delusion, but of an unclean spirit. Science still regards Jesus as the victim of the delusion that certain psychopaths were demon-possessed, but science is only in its infancy, and infants make a great many mistakes. Dr. Carl Wicklin would regard what is fashionable in science today as already out of date on this subject. He knows because he has devoted over 30 laborious years to the study of the subject that malevolent entities can and do possess certain individuals. And years ago, William James expressed it as his considered opinion that science would have to face the fact of demon possession. No scientist who fears or obstinately refuses to face the facts of psychic science is worthy of the name scientist. Indeed, he is no true sense of scientist, rather is he a bigot. Whenever a medium is controlled by a discarnate human being, he is possessed by a spirit. In his case, the control is usually a good spirit. He resists control by discarnate evil spirits just as he resists the evil influence of incarnate evil persons. But where, for any reason, there is little or no resistance, evil spirits gain an entry. Human beings on this earth are incarnate spirits. Some are good, some are bad. At death, when they are clothed in the etheric body, they are still the same persons, good or evil spirits. Evil spirits are discarnate human beings. They are not a special order of satanic entities, nor are they damned souls. They are evil because they are undeveloped. They may have themselves to blame for this, but in view of the solidarity of the human race, few of us would care to express an opinion. I cannot recall a single instance where Jesus spoke an angry word to these undeveloped spirits. He merely commanded them to go out of their victims. In the case of the Gadarene madman, Jesus, in kindly pity, said, Unclean spirit, come out of him. This seems to have increased the spirit's frenzy. What have you and I in common? He said. You are Jesus, the Son of the Most High. Do not torment me. Jesus then sought the assistance of the madman by trying to awaken him to self-recollection. What is your name? He asked. But the man could not answer, for the evil spirit had too strong a hold on him. My name is Legion, said the spirit for we are many. What exactly did the spirit mean? I wonder. Perhaps Dr. George Smith's discovery may throw light upon it. Agadara, Dr. Smith found tombs and a stone which had been dug up bore the inscription Legion 14. May it not have been that the legionnaires died fighting like madmen and that the spirits of these maddened warriors, now one, now another, were possessing this poor fellow who was probably an undeveloped medium? The maddened spirit, who at the same time was possessing the man, said to Jesus, If you are going to cast us out, let us remain near here. Do not send us into the desert, or worse still, into the abyss where devils dwell. Send us rather into the swine on yonder hillside. The rest of the story is not easy to understand. Possibly the exercising of the spirit caused the man to have a bad paroxysm and that he ran towards the herd of swine which, being terrified, rushed headlong down a hill into the sea. The swine herds fled and reported what had happened and the people of Gadara coming out saw the madman sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed in his right mind. Now, the story of exorcism of this unclean spirit would in no way help us if, as some would have us believe, Jesus was unique and different in kind from us. But he plainly told us that we should do the works that he did. And we do. Unclean spirits are being exorcised today by the same psychic power as that possessed by Jesus. 
Thus do the psychic phenomena of today make it possible for us to believe that similar phenomena occurred in New Testament days. The healed madman of Gadara besought Jesus that he might remain with him, but Jesus had a higher mission for him. He was to return home and tell his friends. What? He was to tell them that the healing had come from God. Jesus did not say that he had healed the man. He attributed his power to the Spirit of God working through him. And that same Spirit is working signs and wonders through God's servants today. It is well to notice that, as he was leaving Gadara, Jesus did not mind this remarkable case of healing being mentioned. It was only when the unhealthy excitement of the crowds was hindering his work that he told people to keep silence about the healing. When he got back to Capernaum landing stage, a great multitude was there to welcome him. Among them was one of the three rulers of the synagogue named Jarius. He was a man of good position like the magistrate of an English town. And forgetting his dignity, he fell at the feet of Jesus, crying piteously, O oh, Master, my little daughter, she is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands upon her, and she shall live. Jesus at once walked away with him, and a great multitude followed and thronged him. Jairus was in a great hurry, for if his daughter died, he knew that it would be too late. But in the crowd was a foreign woman from the Roman city of Caesarea Philippi, and she had traveled down to Capernaum, believing that if she could but touch his clothes, she would be healed of a disease that had troubled her for twelve years. She managed to touch the tassel of his cloak and was immediately healed. Jesus, though thronged by the multitude, knew that someone had drawn power from his body and exclaimed, Who touched me? Peter, answering for the crowd, said, How can you ask who touched you when you can see this surging crowd pressing against you? Jesus ignored this ignorant answer and looked around to see who had done it. The woman then came forward and confessed. And Jesus said, Daughter, your faith has healed you. It was not a miracle. It was in complete accord with known laws of psychic science. Faith is as scientific as it is religious. Faith can develop healing power within oneself. It can also draw from another the healing power with which he is charged. The faith of the woman drew from Jesus life-giving power. It was natural, as natural as law and love. While the woman was rejoicing in her renewed strength, some servants ran up to Jairus and whispered, Your daughter is dead. End of chapter. Meet me at the next video as we continue on with the psychic life of Jesus.